Uh, blessings to you. Well, the world doesn't know what a mom is anymore and uh, couldn't determine if one showed up at their door. And, um, and yet they you know, relegated moms to such a, a horrible position in our society. If you really think about it, it we don't really attribute, you know, they say they're for women's rights and all that kind of stuff, right? But in reality, they really do not care for women. And uh, if they did, they wouldn't say or do the things that they do. Uh, but more or less, you know, it is the way the world is. The church should be different, isn't it? The church of the redeemed should be quite different than the world. And the world should see it, how we uh, uh, not only appreciate uh, who women are and how God created them, who moms are, the way God intended for them to, to be moms. And he created us to be uh, a family, just like God wants a family. We desire family, too. So all that, it's, it's innate in, in every human being. And uh, it's only when you really sear your conscience and go against your conscience uh, that you end up with a whole different set of circumstances. Is that which we face today? And you can see how the world is going. So moms, uh, we totally, totally appreciate. Just to echo what uh, Anthony said, appreciate you. Ladies, appreciate you, ladies. Uh, this ministry could not function if it wasn't for women, moms who serve, and grandmothers who serve in this fellowship. So, so much uh, appreciative and grateful uh, for the moms and ladies that the Lord has brought to this fellowship and continue to bring to this fellowship. So, uh, blessings to you and happy Mother's Day. Enjoy today and uh, encourage your husbands and children to really bless your mom, bless uh, your wife, and uh, God created them. And the image and likeness, just like us, an image and likeness of God. And everything about, you know, the way he created woman and man, it's, it speaks to our creator so much. And uh, he created them both male and female. Uh, all the, uh, the character and the characteristics of God are, are given to male and female. So together can join together. You see the image of God. That's why marriage is so important, is the image of God built together in a marriage. And so... Blessings to you guys. So let's pray. Uh, we have Hebrews chapter 8 today, but before we get into Hebrews 8, we do want to answer this question. Who was Melchizedek? So let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you as to a, a faithful God, a faithful God who loves us infinitely, who has a measure uh, with no measure of grace for us. We thank you that the Holy Spirit poured out on the church is given to each one who is member of the church, the church of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we are members of the body of Christ, but we're also members of one another. And so help us not to forget that, Lord, that we are together as one in Christ and we are members of each other. So, Lord, we pray that today, by being together, we will experience not only the grace of God, the love of God, but the fellowship of the Spirit. We thank you that we have your word, and today, as we open it and be encouraged and uplifted, we would reach, Lord, a closer place in a relationship with you, just drawing close, inch by inch, closer to Jesus. We thank you for every blessing and goodness, and we ask you, Lord, that you teach us today through your spirit, and it teaches more about your son. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm just going to meander around 7 and 8 today. And uh, we're not going to finish 8 today. Um, it'll take some time to get through 8, although 8 is very, a very short chapter. But we do want to uh, bring you some information regarding Melchizedek. Who was this man? Now, he is mentioned in different parts of the Bible. And uh, one of the passages of the Bible that we read quite often has been the book of Hebrews. The last few months we've been in Hebrews, and uh, it's in, repeated in 5, repeated in chapter 6, repeated in chapter 7, and it's this order of Melchizedek. And so who was this man? Now, I do have to tell you this, that Christians for a long time have different views of this. So we, we have to agree that this is something that, although it's interesting to look into, it, it's really no means that we can be 100% dogmatic, and therefore if I'm 100% right on this, then you're 100% wrong. It, it has nothing to do with that. We're not looking for splitting hairs, as it were, but we're looking for an understanding of Scripture. And Christians for a long time have had this idea that he is just a type. He's just a real person and a type and a figure like Moses and Joseph and people of the Old Testament who simply 
represented an aspect of Christ. In this case, Melchizedek was a priest and a king of Salem, and therefore a real historical figure, a real king in the, in the area called Cana, Canaan at the time. And so he lived at the time of Abraham. And so that's where some people have landed, that this is just a, a type, a figure, a real person who really existed, but because of his title and because of where he lived, he is a person who really looks a lot like Christ, just like Abraham in some areas, just like David in some areas, but he's nothing more than a historical figure. Okay, so that's one interpretation. Another interpretation, it would be the ones that other Christians have, is that he is really an appearance of Christ. He is really an appearance of Christ in a pre-incarnate, as it were. Pre-incarnate means before he was born in Bethlehem, he appeared in the Old Testament. Now, we call this a Christophany. Christians, we have called this a Christophany. It's, a, it's rather a title, basically a, 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 a term that is used for an appearance of Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem. Of course, we know Christ being God has always existed. He existed before time began. He is the creator, according to the Bible. But he appeared in the Old Testament as a man or as a messenger of God in some parts of the Old Testament, which is a very, very, very interesting uh, passages to go through. If you ever find them, uh, those are awesome things to look into. Jesus in all the scriptures is what we call it. Jesus in all the scriptures, not only through people and types and figures and shadows and examples and illustrations, but he really did appear in the Old Testament before Bethlehem. Uh, in his glory and his in, uh, before his incarnation, he appeared in the Old Testament. Sometimes he would be called the messenger of the Lord. He would be called the, 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 the angel of the Lord. Don't worry about the word angel. He's not a created being. An angel just simply means a messenger, a messenger. So he appears as the messenger of the Lord in the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes he appears as a man, as it were, uh, when Adam and Eve were in the garden. It says that they were hiding from God and they heard God walking in the garden, right? You see these, these aspects of God as if he was a man way back in the Old Testament, walking with God. They heard God walking. Well, who did they hear? Well, they certainly heard God in the Garden of Eden walking. That would be Jesus. That would be Jesus walking. Every time God appears in some human form, uh, it is always Christ pre-Bethlehem. Always pre-Bethlehem. So we have differences appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. A lot of them to go through. Don't want to give you all the details on it because it takes too long to explain. But this whole start and this whole thing started in the book of uh, Hebrews by the fact that the writer of Hebrews tells the Hebrew listeners, the Jewish people at the time, the believers, that they were not keen of hearing the word of God because they were immature. They were immature because they ought to have been teachers by now. They were still drinking yeah, I love this picture. They're drinking milk. They simply were still stuck in the elementary principles of the gospel, and they had grown very little. And by this time, Paul uh, Hebrew says, you should have been teaching by now, but you're not. And I st you still need somebody to go over the elementary principles of the gospel and the Bible, and therefore you're not ready to engage in more meat. And the meat there has to do with this particular character named Melchizedek. He wanted to tell them about Melchizedek in chapter 5, but he says, but you are not able to digest this. Just as I wouldn't give a baby a steak, I wouldn't give you things that are very deep in the Bible, deeper as you were. You know, I know sometimes we get afraid of deep things in the Bible, afraid we won't understand it, but they're there. They're there for us to uh, explore and dig and find out more about Christ, because when you dig through the Bible, you'll find Christ, Christ in all the scriptures. So this whole thing started with this idea. I can't teach you about the deeper things of God because you're a baby. You should be older in Christ, but you're still a baby. You can only digest milk. Those are the elementary principles of the gospel. But I want you to grow. I want you to be more sophisticated in your learning. I want you to grow as a Christian, and I want you to understand who Melchizedek is. That's the whole thing. And then we get to chapter 7, right? And he begins to tell us. And begins to tell us this important story that it's, we don't have a lot of details, but it's in Genesis chapter 14. If you want to turn there really quick. Genesis 14, we looked at that last week. Genesis 14, and we'll look at 17. Look at verse 17 of chapter 14. And it's the story of Abraham. 
And it's kind of interesting. A lot of Christians don't know this part of Abraham's story. They know the promises of God. They know he was in Haran when God promised him the five promises of God to, uh, to Abraham, that he would be a great blessing to all the nations. But then there's a story here that is sort of sandwiched between the promises. It's Abraham is actually a military leader. Lo and behold, he's a military guy. And it had to do with the, 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 the kings the kings of the east, there's four kings from the east, and they come down the Jordan Valley and they capture uh, men, 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 women and children, men, women and children. And one of those families was Lot's family, which happened to be Abraham's nephew. And he's captured and he's taken all the way to Syria. So Abraham goes up to Syria with 318 of his uh, household, and he goes and he fights against these kings and he defeats them. And he comes back with Lot and all the, all the goods and the spoils from the war. And he meets Melchizedek. Verse 17. After his return from the defeat of uh, Kedolomer and the kings who were with them, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. So the king of Sodom was actually, Sodom was actually not as bad as it became later on in Genesis 18. Uh, as of this time, he were, there were still some righteous people in there. And the king of Sodom was not against Abraham yet. He turns against Abraham later. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of the God Most High. And he blessed him. And he said, blessed be Abraham, God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him a tenth of it all. Abraham blessed him. And, the, and then it goes into the king of Sodom. So this is, that's all we have. This is a very, very short little passage of this Melchizedek. And it's an interesting character because whoever he is, he's very important. Because Abraham submits to him spiritually. He is blessed by Melchizedek. And Abraham gives a tenth of all his spoils. And it's always the case the greater blesses the lesser, right? So in this case, Melchizedek is in a greater spiritual authority than Abraham was. Now, it's interesting because Abraham knew God, but so did Melchizedek. It's one of those interesting stories that you can kind of dive in a little bit more. Were there other people before Abraham that knew about the true God? The answer is yes. Job knew about God, and he was around, uh, just around the time of Abraham, just before Abraham. Melchizedek knew about God. And so all these civilizations that eventually corrupted knew about the one true God at one point. They knew about the flood. They knew about the things that have happened before. Obviously, uh, if you look at the archaeological record, we talked about that, you see very little idols at the bottom layers, and you see more idols as we get closer to our time. So the further back you go, less idols. The closer to our time, more idols. How can that be? Because everybody started with the knowledge of the true God. Everybody called them the one true God, the creator God. Now, they might not have known his name, like the Hebrew people knew him as Yahweh. They didn't know him as the great I am. They didn't have a personal relationship with him. God did not give him scriptures, as it were, like in Mount Sinai. But they knew him, and they knew him personally, and they knew he was the creator God, and they worshiped him, right? Just Romans 1, back again. Those who had no law before the law ever came knew God, and they actually worshiped God without having the law. They had a law in their own hearts unto themselves. So here is Melchizedek, blesses him, and of course, he brings out bread and wine. Now, every one of us would have, you know, caught on to that, right? Because this is from way back then, even until now. Don't we do that? Don't we do that symbolically here in our church as well? Yeah, we do. We call the communion, right? Because the Passover of the Jews and the communion of uh, Jews and Christians today and, 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 and what we call the Lord's Supper uh, goes back to even before a, a Moses. It goes back to this. What was it? It was simply a fellowship meal. It was a fellowship meal. What's the Passover? A fellowship meal. God wanted to have dinner with his, child, with his children. Don't you like to have children, uh, dinner with your children? Well, God does too. And he brings out bread and wine. It's always the symbol of the communion table. Of course, it's finalized in Christ, right? Christ tells us the ultimate meaning that all those things were symbols of his blood and his body that would be shed and broken for our sins. So it all culminates in Christ, but it goes back, way back to even before Moses. 
And it's, it's given by this man who is Melchizedek. He is uh, the word Melek, it's king. The word uh, uh, Zedek comes from the word Zedek. It means righteous. You know, Melchizedek, he is a righteous king. He is a righteous king who is also, as it says in here in verse 18, the king of Salem, right? He's also a king of Salem and the priest of the God Most High. So he was a king and a priest. Of course, we talked about that. And he has a covenant meal with Abraham. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, I'll just kind of go a little bit quicker now. Just to kind of, we got the basis. In Galatians chapter 3, we're told a very interesting passage. Galatians 3, the gospel was preached to Abraham. The gospel was preached to Abraham. The father of all who believed, Abraham, had the gospel preached to him. Right? And if you ever ran into that passage, you know, if you ever stopped and looked at it and wondered, what does that mean? Well, you're in good company because a lot of people wonder, what, how does that mean? Uh, how does that work? God gave him five promises. God gave him five promises that all the people of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. His seed will come into the world. That would be Christ, and all of us will be blessed through Christ. But we're told something interesting about Abraham is that his, the, the gospel was preached to him. And the word there that Paul uses is actually the word for preaching, like, like kerygma, like, like when you go and share the gospel with someone, like in the book of Acts, he was actually told to him uh, the gospel, in an Old Testament way. Obviously, this is before the cross. This is before anything happened. How could that work, right? Well, it's interesting that in the Old Testament, we have stories, right? And in the New Testament, we have some interesting uh, insight into those stories, right? So I want you to turn to Acts 7 with me real quick. We have stories in the book in the Old Testament, and then we have a, I guess you could say, a summary of those stories sometimes in the New Testament, and sometimes in the New Testament, Acts chapter 7, we have insights that were not told to us in the Old Testament. And what I mean by that is there were certain things that were not recorded in the Old Testament that the Jewish people knew. And God knew that they knew that. And therefore, there's a record of what they knew, not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. Right? Which means this, that there were certain things that are not fully recorded in the Old Testament. You have to go to the New Testament to find out what exactly did that mean. Okay, and I'll give you one example here. This is Acts 7, and this is the story. This is Acts 7. This is the story of Stephen and his martyrdom, the first martyr of the church, Stephen. Right? And what's interesting, Stephen is given his account. He's given his testimony. Uh, before the Sadducees and Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. He'll eventually be killed by them, but before he's killed, he gives them this incredible testimony of himself and of the people of Israel. So if you ever read chapter 7 of Acts, uh, I encourage you to do it. It gives you like a history of Israel much more insightful uh, than sometimes Old Testament passages. But I want to uh, look at verse 2. It says, Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Now, what is that? How is that important? We're told in the book of Genesis that God appeared to Abraham first in Haran. That's the first time God appeared to Abraham. But here in the New Testament, we have something that happened even before Haran. Before the Old Testament tells us a story, there was an incident in which God had appeared to Abraham. Where? It says in Mesopotamia. That's where Abraham lived. He lived in the Ur of the Chaldeans. He lived at the place where he was an idolater. He lived in Babylon, as it were. And God appeared to him there before he appeared to him in Haran. Now, you wouldn't know this from the Old Testament. Genesis didn't tell you that. The New Testament tells you that. All right. What that means is there's, the point is there's stories in the Old Testament that are not fully revealed in the Old. They're fully revealed in the New. Right? You know what I'm saying? That there's stories that have more the meat of it. It's in the New Testament. Uh, I'll give you another example. It's the story of uh, the prophecies of Daniel. The prophecies of Daniel about what would happen uh, in, uh, with Antiochus and the abomination of desolation. Do you know the prophecies of Daniel, the, 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 the fulfillment of those prophecies uh, about Antiochus going into the temple and desecrating it? Those are not in the Bible. They're in a Jewish history book. They're in a Jewish history book called the Maccabees. The Maccabees tells you what Antiochus did 
in fulfilling what Daniel prophesied. Fascinating, isn't it? So there are things in the Old Testament that we're told, but we're not told everything. The New Testament tells us even more, and sometimes even Jewish history tells us a little bit more about what actually happened with the prophecies of Daniel. Now, of course, the ultimate revelation of Daniel, you have to go into what Jesus said about what will happen at the abomination of desolation, still future for us. But just to, just to kind of get you an idea, there are things in the Old Testament we really don't un fully understand until we read the New. So how was the gospel preached to Abraham? Was there a situation where Abraham met God and God revealed to him the gospel? Well, you could see that there was one occasion that it could happen. Abraham, chapter 22 of Genesis, has told Abraham, take your son, your only son, take him up to this mountain and offer him a sacrifice, a physical bodily sacrifice unto me. You must kill your son. And Abraham obeyed the Lord, takes, takes Isaac up to Mount Moriah, takes him up to three days. They have to carry the wood. Isaac carries the wood. He's much younger than Abraham, right? He goes up to the wood, uh, up to the mountain, and he's about to plunge a knife into Isaac. Abraham tells him, like, son, you're going to have to die. Isaac is willing they're going to go through this whole process. Horrible thing, right? How can God, the man, the human sacrifice, has never happened before? And before he plunges his knife into his son, an angel stops him. And he tells him, Abraham, now I know you love God. Don't do this to, the son, to your son. Cause him no harm. See, God has provided something for you. And he looks to the right, and there's a, a ram. There's a, an offering. And they offer that sacrifice on that mountain. And it was an illustration. Now, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that Abraham got his son back. Got his son back. And it says it was a type of the resurrection, meaning that he got his son after his son was dead, and he got him back. Because in his mind, Abraham, in Abraham's mind, his son was dead, and it took him three days to get up to Mount Moriah. Now, you can kind of put it all together, right, in your mind. What is this illustration? A father sacrificing his son in three days, he gets him back? Yeah, what does that sound like? It's the gospel story, isn't it? And lo and behold, Mount Moriah, it's the mountain range where Mount Calvary is, where Mount Calvary is, where the temple was put together. So this is the mountain range where God would one day, the father would sacrifice his own son, and there'll be no, no substitute for Jesus because he was our substitute. There was a substitute for Isaac. A ram was caught in the thicket, and he brought him in and offered him to the Lord, and he called the place Yahweh Jireh, the place where God will provide himself an offering, a ram, a lamb, right? And so on that mountain, it was explained to Abraham, as it were, in an illustration, in a type, that one day God will get his son back after three days. Beautiful, isn't it? It's all in the Old Testament. Now, we, we, we certainly have to look at the New Testament to fully understand it, fully get it, but this is exactly what happened. Now, in the book of John, we have this incredible insight. John says, uh, Jesus says in the book of John, when Abraham saw my day, he rejoiced, and he saw it, and was glad, right? And the, the Jew said to him, you're not even 50 years old. How can you know Abraham? How can you have seen him? And Jesus said, I tell you, tell you, truly, truly, right? Uh, verily, verily means truly, truly, like for sure, for sure. You know, we don't, say, we don't say that in English, right? Truly, truly. I guess if you speak like maybe older English. But, you know, we, we usually add something like for sure, like this is very true, right? And, and, and the way they would say it in the, Old Test in the New Testament, it would be a double, a double word. Verily, verily, truly, truly, meaning an emphasis, like this is for sure, I tell you. That before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus appeals back to the time where, when did Abraham see Jesus? When did Abraham see Jesus and he was glad? It's interesting, right? There was something about Jesus that Abraham knew way back in the Old Testament. He saw his day. He rejoiced in it. Now, when did that happen? Now, here's the question, right? We have to kind of put it in our minds because uh, there are a couple of times where maybe Abraham did see Christ and as an illustration of what would happen to him. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it was the time where Abraham saw Jesus coming into his tent. In the book of Genesis chapter 18, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham 
in his tent, in this tent of Mamre, uh, near the oaks of Mamre, he appeared to him with two angels, right? Read the story, Genesis 18. So were those the things that uh, the Bible speaks about, that the gospel was preached to Abraham? I don't know for sure, but all of them seem to add, add up to this thing that there was a one time where Abraham not just got an illustration, not just got a type or a figure like what happened with Isaac, but he actually had an encounter with a person, and they conversated. They had actually had a meal together. Now, if you had Melchizedek in front of you, what would you guys talk about, right? Uh, Abraham would have talked to Melchizedek. They would have sat down together, ate the, ate the meal together, had a communion table, and, of course, they would have spoken to him about something regarding Melchizedek, something about his life. Right? Now, fast forward a little bit. 400 years later, from the time of Melchizedek and Abraham, we hear nothing of Melchizedek for some time until we get to Psalm 110. So for 400 years, from Genesis 14, three verses in Genesis 14, we hear nothing of Melchizedek. It's like he goes silent for a while until David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, looks back at this event in Abraham's life and he says, You know, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Right? God made a declaration. The Lord said to my Lord, right? Yahweh said to my Lord. And, and this is, of course, what Jesus said about David, is that David actually was speaking about the Messiah, that God would speak to the Messiah, and God would give the Messiah all the enemies as footstool for his feet, meaning that they would be defeated, and the Messiah would rule and reign. And out of a declaration... The Messiah would be the king. The Messiah would be the king. And of course, this is a, 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 the Melchizedek. And later on in that, in that chapter, it's presented as the high priest, right? So the Messiah would be the king because the Lord declared it. And then a second, dec second declaration is made about the priesthood that Melchizedek, the Messiah, will be like Melchizedek, a priest after Melchizedek, all in the same chapter. And it's an amazing declaration because in Psalm 110, you have this person, the Messiah, who is both king by God's declaration and priest by God's declaration. And it's the same person. It's the same Messiah who gets both declarations from the divine. Uh, the divine. It's Christ himself who becomes both king and priest. Now, let's turn to Hebrews 1 very quickly. I want to get to Hebrews 8 and kind of delaying the inevitable, but I thought it was important that we... Uh, Kind of bring this all together. So you can make up your mind. Who is Melchizedek, right? Hebrews chapter 1. Now look at verse 8. The point of Hebrews 1 is to tell you that Jesus is divine. That Jesus is not an angel. He is a divine being. And so much so, he is in equality with the Father. He's in equality with the Father. Verse 8. But to the Son... The Son of God, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This is from the psalm. In the righteous scepter of his kingdom, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. So God says to his son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So God calls somebody else God. Now, that's an interesting passage, isn't it? Now, uh, if a Jehovah's Witness shows up at your house, you can show him this verse because it's a real clear declaration of who Jesus is. God turns to his son and says, God... I'm going to make uh, your throne is forever, and your righteous scepter will be like a kingdom, will be of his kingdom. Righteousness and lawlessness will not be tolerated. Right? This is verse 8. Look at verse 12. And like a mantle, you roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, but at the same time, but you are the same, and your years will, come, uh, will not come to an end. The same declaration that Jesus is forever. Right? Heaven and earth will pass away. But Jesus will always be there. He, all the garments, like uh, all the, uh, the universe, like a garments will be changed. But the Lord will never change. His years will never come to an end as a king. In verse 13, but to which of the angels he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Again, from Psalm 110, right? So Hebrews 1 is about the divinity of Christ and brings in this declaration of that Jesus, from Psalm 110, is the king. And the same Psalm 110 tells us that the Messiah is also after Melchizedek. So there's some really strong evidence, as it were, that what the Psalm 110 is speaking about is that Jesus is both the king and both the priest in the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus is God 
And is Jesus also Melchizedek? Appears to be that way, isn't it, from Psalm 110? Because J uh, David looks back at this event and says, that's the Messiah. I've looked and that's the Messiah. He's Lord, he's a king, and he's the priest. And he couldn't believe it that the same person was the same one. Right? Because, uh, you know, looking at the Old Testament, of course, you would see that, hey, the priest, they usually come from Levi, right? Uh, from Abraham, from Isaac to Jacob, right? Jacob had Leah, and the sons of Leah are there. And guess who is the third one? Levi, the priestly line. But he also had Judah, the kingly line. Now, it's interesting that priests and kings were separated, right? Even from way back in the Old Testament, kings and priests were never the same person. They were institutionally different offices, right? A king had a throne, a priest had the tabernacle, and they, they would never meet as the same person. God would never allow that until you had a change. And we described that in chapter 7 of last week. We had a change in the law. The law began to dissipate. It's fulfilled in Christ. And now a new priesthood arises. Not the one of, a, uh, of uh, Aaron. Not the one of Moses, right? Because they were both Levites. The high priest came from Aaron. The Levites had all the priests. But they were actually, uh, uh, the, the priests actually came from uh, Levi. But now Jesus does not come from Levi. He actually comes from Judah, the kingly line. But they're now the same person. The king and the priest are the same person. Not from Aaron, not from Levi. But actually, his priest who comes from Melchizedek, which goes way back into Genesis. And so, uh, is it the same person? Is the Lord himself Melchizedek? Right? Uh, a case can be made. And I will give you this. I'll finish with this. Either way, a case can be made. There are those who believe is a type of Christ, and they may have a point. But don't deny the fact that it is possible, very possible, that the same Melchizedek who was there in Genesis 14 and Abraham gave honor and was blessed by uh, Melchizedek, Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek, that Melchizedek was the Lord Jesus himself in a, the, in a Christophany, as it were, a pre-Bethlehem a pre appearance of Jesus. Now, one thing I'll leave you with this is, do you remember at the cross, Jesus paid for our sins at the cross, and on the cross... To the, the, the Jews, right, the, 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 the Sadducees and the high priests, they didn't, they didn't want Jesus to be king, right? They didn't want him to be recognized as king. And Pilate, Pilate, to go after the, 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 the religious Jews, he put a sign in Greek and Latin and Aramaic, right? He put a sign in, in Hebrew, Latin, and, and, and Greek that Jesus was the king of the Jews, and they got mad at Pilate before making that sign. Remember that? John 19, I think it is. And they said, no, he said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate said, no, what I have written, I have written. Let that be up there. And it was literally said, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews in three languages. Now, what was Jesus doing on the cross at that point? Well, Jesus was paying for our sins. The book of Hebrews says he was offering himself as an offering to God for sin. This is what a priest would do. A priest would... Offer himself, offer an, I'm sorry, offer a sacrifice to God. In this case, the book of Hebrews says Jesus did not do this in the temple. He actually offered up himself. It's the first time the priest and the offering were the same person. And it was Jesus offer up himself. The cross is what we say the altar. It's an Old Testament picture of the altar, the altar of sacrifice where the, where the lamb was slain, where the, the sacrifice of the animals were, were slain. The cross becomes the, the altar. And so the high priest, our high priest, goes to the cross and offers up himself. But what's written above him is his king. The priest and the king on the cross at the same time. God was letting us know that this was much more than just a, a sacrifice of a man. God was putting it completely in everybody to be viewed, to be viewed by everyone, is the fact that Jesus was both king and priest on the cross himself. Uh, it was recognized that Jesus was making propitiation for our sins on the cross as, a, as an offering, but he was also the king. And, 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 you know, you couldn't make this up because it wasn't the Jews who put it together. The Jews didn't want it. The disciples weren't even around. It was a pagan ruler, Herod, who said, put that, put that thing up there. 
put the king. And he wanted to do it to spite the Jews. He didn't do it because he believed he was the king. He did it to spite the Jews. And yet he was fulfilling the very thing that God had intended. Our king and priest was making propitiation for our sins on the cross, on that altar. And at the same time, everybody would recognize that's the king. No wonder the Roman centurion said, this really is the son of God after he died. He couldn't imagine. And, and we look back and go, oh, it's all there, isn't it? It's all there. If we just look into it and paid attention to it, God has made it possible that this great high priest, our king, has a throne. And now he has become our high priest, not on earth where the temple had been destroyed by now. It's destroyed twice. But now he is in heaven, in the heavenly throne, in the heavenly temple, um, interceding for us, interceding for us. So he is the final word, by the way. He is the final word. He's both king and priest, and he very could well be that Melchizedek that Abraham appeared to, or he appeared to Abraham, and he blessed him. And that's where we can trust Jesus. We could appeal to him as our highest authority. Now, let's go to Hebrews 8 now. Delayed it enough. We'll only go for a few minutes. And we'll pick it up next time we read Hebrews 8. We won't finish today. We won't finish the chapter today. But I want to leave you with something. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our mediator. Oh, I need a mediator. Last week I needed a priest. Right? You need a priest too. Right? Whatever idea you have of a priest, just ignore it. Right? We need the high priest. Right? All of the priests are no good. Jesus is our priest. He is our priest. However, there is a priesthood, I told you, that still goes on, right? It's a priesthood of all believers. We're all priests, and we're all called to be priests. Uh, as Christians, we're all called to be priests. And one day, the book of Revelation says, we'll also be kings, king and priest. But in the meantime, we have to pick up our cross, don't we? Pick up our cross, just like Jesus, right? He first was our priest. He went to the cross. Just like us, we're priests. We have to carry our cross. But then, like that song says, and we'll exchange it someday for a crown, right? You'll get a crown. It's a kingly crown. Jesus will uh, reward us, and we will reign with him forever and ever. So the priest, these priests, born-again believers, who carry the priesthood of all believers today, right, have to bear the cross just like our priest did. And one day, our priest, because he rose from the dead, we will rise from the dead unto eternal life, and we'll be called kings of the Most High God. He will be the king of kings. We will be kings under him. But nonetheless, we need a mediator. All right, the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Now the main point, verse 8, chapter, uh, verse 1, the main point is what has been said is this. We have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, he is almost summarizing it for us. And this is what chapter 8 uh, kind of is. It's... Uh, the, at least the first few verses. It's a summary of what the Jewish believers at the time needed to hear. Remember, these were believers, right? The, the, the guys who, wrote, who uh, received this letter, it's a letter. And the recipients of that letter, those who received it, are Jewish believers. Around the time of 60 to 65 AD, around the, time of, uh, around the place of Jerusalem, just where our Lord was crucified, and they can look outside and look at all the Old Testament system was still in place. This is before the temple was destroyed. So historically, very important to have a letter like this because we know what kind of things they were struggling with. Their struggle was the fact that they can look at the Old Testament system and say, wow, it's still there. I wonder if I still have a connection to that. I wonder if I still should participate in that. And they look at the high priest and they look at the priest and the sacrifices and they say, isn't it wonderful? Just like they had all their lives. And the writer of Hebrews comes back and says, you know what? As wonderful as that system was set up by God, it is now fading away. It is now going to be obsolete. It has been fulfilled, and therefore it doesn't have power anymore to do anything for you. It's the batteries are out, as it were, right? There's no batteries and there's no power in it anymore. The Shekinah glory is not there. The sacrifices have been fulfilled. The glory of God is not in that temple. The glory of God is now in the temple, the church, the body of Christ who's been put together now under the new covenant. This is what we're going to talk about next time. It's the new covenant, how powerful it is to have the new covenant. Because if you kind of have a change in priesthood, Right? It's not Aaron, it's Jesus, it's not the priest of Levites, it's Melchizedek. If you're going to change priesthood, 
then you have to change the law as well. So the law has been fulfilled, and the covenant, the old covenant, has been fulfilled. Guess what you need if you have an old one? You need a new one. And that new covenant is what uh, we're so thankful for, but sometimes we don't really think about it too much. The new covenant is so important in your life. And, um, and he's warning them, here, uh, don't go back to this. Don't go back to who you were before. Now, none of us, perhaps, um, were Jews at one time, right? None of us will go back to an old covenant relationship with God. But all of us have a past. All of us came from somewhere. And so the temptation of them was to go back to who they were before, under the law. Your temptation might be different. Your temptation might be to go back to who you were before Christ. And the warning is, if you walk out on Christ and go back to an empty religious system, an empty religious system or an empty life that you left, and you go back to that life, you're walking out on the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And if you walk out on the glory of Jesus, it's darkness. No matter what you go back to, once you've met Jesus, you'll never be the same again. I'm telling you, you'll never be the same again. Now, you can go, people can go back to their former life, and they'll tell you, it's horrible. It's a horrible life that I went back to. I thought it was a lot of fun when I was in it. But once I left it and tasted of the glory of God and try to go back, it's like sewer water. What are we doing with that? That's why the, 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 uh, the, the prodigal son went back and ate with the pigs, right? Because it is really a pigsty. And you go back. And, and, the, and, and the writer of Hebrews says this. It's literally walking out on Christ where there's nowhere else to go. And you find your way back to something that you shouldn't be there in the first place. And it's outer darkness. And so all three, all seven chapters, we studied that already. I forgot when we started, but at some point in the past, we started. And we've gone through seven chapters already. And that's the same thing coming back to again, is there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to go but Christ. Uh, nowhere else to go but with Christ. So how do you continue in Christ? And this is a big point in our study, is how do we grow in Christ? How do you keep from going back? How do you keep from being bored? How do you keep from, you know, boredom is a big thing in, in the Christian life, right? Uh, a lot of Christians fall off because of boredom. They think Christ is, well, I'm, I'm a Christian now. I got here to church, and that's all I do. And they don't grow. They, they're not uh, stimulated by the Lord anymore in their lives. They stop engaging the Lord, and one of the things you lose out, and one of the things that you have to do to keep yourself in growing in Christ is to expose yourself to the Word of God. Expose yourself to the Word of God. How do we do that? Well, there's Bible studies, as Anthony mentioned. You can expose yourself to a lot of things, right? Put a lot of effort into putting a lot of Bible studies out so people can expose themselves to the Word of God. But that's one. How about listening to the Word of God? How about reading the Word of God? How about Teaching the word of God to someone. That keeps you in it, don't they? Yeah. It keeps you in study, keeps you teaching, keeps you growing. But either way, expose yourself to the word of God. Another way to grow is to come to our great high priest. This is the point of Hebrews. You have a great high priest. Whether you fail and you fall today, you need to come back to the high priest. Grace and mercy at the time of need. That's what you need today. Mercy and grace at the right time. So if you fail and if you fall today... Come to the great high priest. Don't miss out. Expose yourself to the word of God and come to the great high priest, right? And so the question, and I have to ask you this, have you done that the last few months that we've been studying Hebrews? Have you been exposing yourself to the word of God daily? And have you been coming to the great high priest that we have? And fail and fall, you come to him and you bear your heart to him and he will sympathize with your weaknesses, he says, because he is a man, Yet without sin, he could understand us and he can strengthen us with grace and mercy for the right time. And you can measure. This is the wonderful thing about the book of Hebrews. You can measure yourself if you're growing. Do you know how you measure yourself if you're growing? Ask yourself this question today. Do I have a greater understanding of God's word today than I had last year? Do I have a greater understanding of God's word today than I had last month? Am I growing in my understanding? And I don't mean knowledge, like, do you remember all the things I said? No, that's no, not the knowledge. It's basically a clear light to know what God says and that you can implement that in your life. That's what I mean by growing. You can measure your, your progress. Could you today understand God's word much better, than, let's say last year, and know what to do with it and go home and say, I am going to implement it. 
I am going to love my husband. I'm going to respect him and honor him because that's what God says. And at the same time, husbands, you have to be the love your wife as Christ loved the church because that's what God says. And do you understand that? Oh, pastor, I know that. I memorized that verse. Okay, then you have a clear light how to implement it. And I would like to see it. Right? You ain't going to show it to me. Although it's lovely, isn't it? But God wants to see it. How you implement that in your life. If you have a greater understanding. A lot of guys have a great understanding of the Bible. They can tell you a lot of things about the history, the background. But that's knowledge. What we're talking about is progress in your Christian walk. How do you implement that? How do you take a verse from today and implement it? Right? It takes wisdom. It takes knowledge and wisdom and the power of God in your life. But let's go back to verse 1. His covenant. The main point of what I said is we have a great high priest. All that we've told you for seven chapters is this. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And he has taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty. So he has told us that he's greater than the prophets. Absolutely. Why? Because the prophets wrote about Jesus. He's greater than any prophet. He's greater than any angel because even as a human, Christ is greater than the angels. Christ is greater than Moses. Moses was a servant, but Jesus is the son. He is greater than Joshua. We told that in Hebrews 3, because Joshua could take him into the promised land, but he couldn't bring him into the rest. He couldn't bring him into the eternal rest. He can bring him into the land of Israel, but he could not bring the rest. He is greater than Aaron, the priest? Absolutely. Why? Because Aaron could only offer shadows, bulls and goats and pigeons and sacrifices like that and lambs. And they were simply shadows. But the ultimate priest, Jesus, offered up himself. He is greater. After, uh, he's a greater priest because he is greater than Aaron because he's after Melchizedek's order, not the Levite's order. And so the greatness of Christ is he could do something for the sinner that nobody else can do. And what needs to be done for the sinner, Christ can do it. No one else. Right? And therefore, people look for saviors. Look for, sometimes they look for themselves to save themselves. Right? People look for the government to save themselves or, uh, or a book or, or, or some kind of uh, personality. They won't save you. They're not meant to save you. Jesus is the only one that can save you. In the book of Hebrews chapter 7 ends with, he can save you now, he can save you always, and he can save you till the end, right? And he, we have such a great high priest who uh, wants to save us unto the uttermost, right? Now, a priest who's on the throne, it says here, he has a throne. That should have grabbed the attention, right? Priests had no throne in the Old Testament. All Aaron did was work, 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 right? All the priests did was just sacrifice, and you can read about it in Leviticus. Boy, those guys were busy. Right? Why? There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of sin going on. So a lot of animal sacrifices, a lot of prayers, a lot of teaching, and they never stopped. That's why there were no chairs inside the tabernacle. When you read the tabernacle, right, you read about all the golden, the golden scepter, the golden menorah, the table of showbread, all these things. And guess what's missing? Chairs. No chairs. Why? Because after being tired, right, you want to take a seat. The priest could never seat. They could never get seated. Why? There's always a sinner around, right? There's always sinners, and sinners need forgiveness, and sinners need sacrifices, and therefore they always work. But Jesus has now sat on the throne. Why did he sit on the throne? Why why did he have a seat now? What did Jesus accomplish? He accomplished something that no other priest could do, a final restoration of man to God, the ultimate mediator, He himself is the bridge. He himself is the priest. He himself is the offering. And he brings us to God with such a way that we now can go to him for anything we've ever done, for anything we have fallen and failed. And it's even more than that because in verse 2 it says, a minister in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. What does that mean? Jesus did not go into Jerusalem and do this. He did not go into the temple or a tabernacle made with human hands, pitched with human hands. I mean, it's basically, if you look at the Old Testament, this is good to have a good background in the Old Testament. Remember, it was a original, it was a tent, and they packed it up. It was like you go camping, and you put it away, right? You put the poles away, and you carry it, and you take the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, and, you, the, and the Levites would carry it on, right? And then when the, when the glory of God stopped, they would camp. And you would camp, and you know, I don't know if it's a good day to camp today, but people camp, and you take it out, and you put the poles up, and you pitch the tent, just like you do, 
And the priest began to work again, right? And so Jesus never went into that. He actually went into a place where was the real one, says in verse 2. The real, the true tabernacle. Pastor, are you saying that that wasn't the real one? Well, I'm not saying that. The Bible said it. The Bible said this was a copy. The one that Aaron and Levites went into, the temple, it was a copy. Where's the real one? In heaven. Where did Jesus offer up himself? He went to that heavenly tabernacle with his blood, and he offered himself to the Father and said, this is the sacrifice. After he atoned for our sins on the cross, he offered himself to God and said, God, I'm the great high priest now. It is here. It is completed. I am the sacrifice, and therefore, he did not go into the temple. Right? Now, this is important because if you're a Jew today, you understand what happened to that temple. It doesn't exist. Now, what about your faith? If the place where your eternal security was relying on didn't exist anymore, right? it would be no better than Islam. It would be no better than any other false religion. We would just be simply... Well, I think there was. I think I'm saved. I think Jesus there, did there, right? But something overcame it. It was destroyed by the Romans. No, God put it in a place where it's absolutely untouchable, right? The heavenly realm. He's ministering, as it were, where God is. God is there, and, the, and Jesus is there as, as a great high priest. And so it makes us understand a picture of the heavenly truth. There's something deeper, right? When you look at the Old Testament and what they were doing, it was a shadow, it was a picture, right? Here's a shadow, right? Here's my shadow. The shadow was the Old Testament, uh, the Old Covenant, what the priests were doing. The real thing is Jesus. The real thing is Jesus. And once he's come, verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also has something to offer. Now, this is, this is going to be picked up in chapter 9 and chapter 10. So you hold your horses and, and you, you know, we can get ahead really quick and go, oh, this is it, this is it, and it's exciting. We're going to hold to chapter 9, because in chapter 9 and 10, boy, when, that, when he explains it all, it just makes you cry. It makes you weep because of what Jesus accomplished for us. But he's going to go into a lot more deeper, than, uh, a lot more detail. A priest has to offer something. That's the job of a priest. That's what he does. He's always interceding for sinners. And what the Old Testament priest would do, also, of course, is offer the blood of bulls and goats and animals and sacrifices like that, right? But Jesus accomplished something that is so far above anything that the Old Testament priest could do. What was that? Is that he offered up himself, something that no one else could offer, right? And it's been accepted. And we know it's been accepted by God because he has sat down. He has sat down. It's complete. It's final. God has accepted that sacrifice. Verse 4. Now, if we were on the earth... He would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. Now, if Jesus would have done his sacrifice on the earth, meaning that if he would have brought uh, his sacrifice to God on the earth, it would have been something like this, right? He would have to be a Levite. He would have to be a priest. He would have to be go into the temple. He would have to do everything according to the law of Moses, verse 4. But the, the Bible says in verse 5, Now who serve a copy, of, uh, a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Right? Of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to put the tabernacle up, he said, he says, uh, see, he says, that you make it according to the pattern which I've shown you on that mountain. Right? So here's Jesus. Doesn't go into Jerusalem. The priesthood of Christ is associated with heaven, not earth, right? Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We always think about that, right? Where, where's Jesus today, right? Where we not, as little kids today, where's Jesus today? Right? And they'll tell you, you know, uh, they'll either point here or they'll point there, right? And they'll be like, yes, he's in your heart through the Holy Spirit, but he's in heaven. He is in heaven. He is in heaven and his ministry, his ministry now is in heaven, not in earth, it's important, right? The priests on earth are always associated with this. But the priest of Jesus, the priesthood of Jesus is always associated with heaven, eternity, right? Those priests were only serving a copy. You know, the tabernacle and the temple, as glorious as it was, you read it in 1 Kings, how 
uh, Solomon dedicated the temple and the glory of God came and the priest couldn't even serve anymore because the glory of God was so heavy upon that temple. And it's marvelous. You wonder, you go, wow, this is amazing. God did that for the Jewish people. Yes, and it was only a shadow. It was only a copy. Meaning that when Moses went out to Mount Sinai, and this is something, again, um, we're told a little bit of that in the Old Testament, but here in the New Testament, it's clear. Picture clear. Now imagine the Ten Commandments. Or watch that movie, The Ten Commandments, right? Charlton Heston goes up to the mountain, right? Do you like that movie? I do. And he goes up to the mountain, and he receives the tablets, right? He gets angry, and he breaks the tablets because they're sinning, right? And he gets a second set of tablets written by God. But in that process, we're not told that very clear in the Old Testament, except here in this passage. It's explained to us, right? Because as, as he's writing about this, he's, he's quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus. See that you do everything according to what you have shown you on that mountain. What did Moses see on that mountain? Yeah, he saw a temple. He saw the glorious temple. He saw heaven, as it were. Uh, remember, it says that God came down to the mountain, right? Moses went up, and God came down on that mountain, and they met together, and they spoke together. Even God says, I speak to Moses as a friend, face to face. Right? He spoke to oh, Now, you wonder. Nobody can see God and live. How did Moses live? Right? He must have been talking to probably Jesus. Absolutely, right? Remember the story, the fabulous story, Exodus 33? Moses says, Lord, I want to see your glory. I really do. And God says, you cannot live if I show you me. If I show you me, I can't, I can't, you'll die. And then Moses uh, was adamant. I want to see your glory. I want to go where you go. And Moses was a friend of God. He was a committed follower of God. He says, I'll tell you what, Moses, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put you in the cleft. I'm going to put a little hole on a rock. And I'm going to put you in there. And when I walk by, and the glory that passes after that, right, called the, 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 uh, the afterglow, right, the afterglow, that's what you'll see. You will see what's behind me. But, my, but me, my glory, you cannot see directly unless you die. So Moses is put into, this, into the cleft of the rock, and God passes by, and guess what? It just marvelous. That mountain glowed, and God walked by. Incredible. He walked by that mountain, and Moses lit up. His face lit up as he saw just the afterglow. Now, what's important about that story is not just what happened to Moses. It's where he was put. He was put into the rock. He was put into the rock. He was put into a cleft of the rock, meaning that there was a hole. The, the, the rock, or this mountain, had a, a cavity in there, had a, a hole, as it were. And he was put into that hole, and he was kept safe from the glory of God completely obliterating him because he was, he's too holy and too great for us to, to even deal with. So again, it's the rock who is smitten, the rock who is smitten, and in that hole, in that cleft, Moses is put in, is kept safe. Right? Again, it's a picture of Jesus. Jesus was the rock, and he's smitten. He's actually struck. And once the, the rock is struck, then water comes out, right? In the wilderness, there's a rock again, right? Rock of ages, right? Is that song, you ever heard that song, Rock of Ages? Right? Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. That rock had a, a hole, and, then, and that's, that's a picture of Jesus, the rock who had a hole. Right? The holes were his hands and his feet, and, Jesus, and we are put into Christ, and we're kept safe in Christ, only in Christ, and we are able to see God now because we're in Christ. But the rock has to be smitten. The rock has to suffer. Jesus had to suffer. So, again, back to what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying. They serve a copy. What Moses saw was the whole thing. And he was instructed by God. Here are the blueprints. You built this. You go down the mountain and you tell your priest. And you got to build it exactly as you saw it. But it's just a blueprint. The real one is in heaven. Go to the mountain and do everything as I told you and do according to the pattern which you see on the mountain. And so all of it is according to the pattern. The tabernacle, the holy place, the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant, right? There's an Ark of the Covenant in heaven, we're told in the book of Revelation, right? All these things are pictures of where God dwells. He dwells in a temple. There's a heavenly temple. Book of Revelation chapter 4. There's a throne and there's thunder and lightning and a rainbow. Wonderful, amazing things. 
And the only thing that the Jews could do was make a copy. <laughs> I mean, if you've seen that, if you've seen all that and you're instructed to make a copy, you do the best you can, but it's still a copy, right? It's still not the real thing. And yet the priest can only serve in the shadow, in the copy. Why? Because the real one is in heaven. And that's where our Lord's ministry is exercised. Jesus Christ, it says in, the, in chapter 7, he is now an intercessor for us. He intercedes for us. He makes intercession for us in the heavenly one. There is a heavenly throne today. There is a heavenly scene today. And that is where Jesus' ministry is located. Is it great? It's not in Jerusalem today. Right? There's wars and desolations. There's problems. There's issues. And we will be worrying all the time. Oh, no. My salvation is attached to a physical location on earth. And, you know, evil man can destroy it. And evil man can do things. Oh, but my assurance is with the Lord in heaven. He is the high priest. And literally, from chapter 1 through 5, as we read, just read, it's the whole summary of the first seven chapters of, the, of Hebrews. It's like the, you know, the writer of Hebrews, such a good pastor, such a good teacher, he says, all right, now that we've gone this far, let's summarize what we read. And he gives it in about five verses. And I guess you could say, well, if I would just read that, I didn't have to come today. Probably not, but you kind of get the point, right? We still need the fellowship, right? And that's the point, the surpassing greatness of Christ. Think about that today. The surpassing greatness of Christ. That's why apostasy is such a horrible thing. When we hear of Christians who walk away from the Lord, when we hear people that really knew the Lord at once and now they're backslidden and have nothing to do with Christ, it's a horrible thing. Why? Because they have turned their back on the glorious to the miserable, on the glorious to the miserable. Believe me, there's no happy backslider. There's no happy backslider. No one who's known the Christ, the real Christ, and turns his back or wanes or becomes cold toward Christ is ever happy. It's ever okay. It's a miserable experience, right? Speak that from experience, right? If you ever turn cold toward Christ, it's a miserable existence, a miserable experience. You can't wait to get things right. But the longer you wait, the colder it gets, the more miserable it gets. And so we go from the superior, which is Christ, to the inferior, which is anything you turn to. From brightness to darkness, right? From the glorious to the miserable. And the real message is the surpassing greatness of Christ. That's why apostasy is such a horrible thing. And when we hear about it, when we hear about it, whether it's from someone that we know or somebody that we hear about, it's a horrible thing. We shudder at it. Why? Because it really is that bad to turn away from the living God. So today, as we finish, do you, do I, have an understanding of who Christ is today. That's an important thing, who Christ is today. Well, I can say, oh, Jesus is Lord, right? Jesus is God. Well, keep going, right? Because he is more than that toward you today and that he is your great high priest. And do you have a vision of that today? How does it look like Christ interceding for you, both God and man in one person, right? interceding for you? And, and how do you react to that reality? How do you live according to that reality? You can know that Jesus is a great high priest, but how do you react to that? How do you live now that you know that? Right? Don't you live rather differently? It, you ought to live rather differently. You ought to live rather differently in a sense of there's reverence now for Christ. There's a consideration that I am turning away from the greatness of Christ, the great God who loved me and gave himself for me. The great God who Jesus is greater than the angels or anything, any godly man that I know, any religion that I know, and he has secure an acceptance for his people. Meaning that as long as a great high priest is there, you can be accepted by God. Now, how long is Jesus going to be a great high priest? Forever. Forever. And as long as you come back to Christ. See, this is the beauty of backslid backsliding is you can come back to Christ. I'm not saying don't try it. I'm not encouraging it to do it. But there's hope that if you turn to Christ today, he will accept you. He secures your acceptance. You don't have to wonder, am I going to be accepted because I did this and I did that and that horrible thing that I did? If you repent and turn to him, he will accept you. And do you have a vision of Christ today? In the secular entertainment, TV, internet world, right, that saturates our mind, right, that keeps us from thinking about Christ, literally does. The more you're on this, right, and the more we're on entertainment 
system in our mind, right? And looking for that, it lessens in our mind the greatness of Christ because we don't start thinking about him anymore. But today, we're right back to Christ. And that's what men and women need today, that Christ will accept you, that Christ is able to accept you. And the book of Hebrews wants, to understand that, wants us to understand that even more, that we have to understand that Christ is our great high priest, and you need to come back to him. And you need him today. You know you need him today. And it has a serious effect in your life if you don't come back. And therefore, you can come back. And maybe it's somebody, something in your mind, something that's really perturbing you, something's really affected, maybe the way you acted, the way you lived or whatever. But a great high priest is there. And as long as you could see that in the book of Hebrews, that he will accept you despite your failings and fallings, then you can come back to the greatness of Christ. In the book of Hebrews, that's why he's it's almost like a pause, as it were, because he doesn't want anybody to fall behind. And he says, hey, we got chapter 7 under our belts. Let's remember what it means, and let's come back to Christ, and let's live in that reality. Because I'm telling you, the great high priest, I need a priest, and I need a mediator today. I do. Because we, know, we all know, don't live in perfect, perfect um, harmony with God all the time, right? We live in a fallen world. We live in a corrupt world. We live in a corrupt system in which it will corrupt me. And therefore, I need to come to our great high priest daily, deal with him, talk to him, relate to him. And why does he relate to us? With sympathy, with mercy, with grace, because that's what you need today. You need forgiveness today. And for a long time, I thought I needed everything else. And one day came to mind, you know what I really need? I need a shepherd and I need forgiveness. And I find them both in Jesus Christ. Today, you need a priest, a priest who can go before God and not offer up a sacrifice of an animal, but offer up himself. And you need a mediator who can grab God's hand and he can grab your hand and put them together and say, now you're back. Now you can be one with God because of Jesus. All that is what he did. Amazing, isn't it? Now we see Jesus on the cross. We talk about his resurrection. And that there's so much deeper than that, right? We go deeper into what that means because that's the reality. Just don't know it intellectually. Experience the reality and live according to that reality and implement it in your life, in every aspect of your life, your marriage, your relationship with your children, your relationship with, your, with work, your relationship with family, your relationship with everything that you have. Implement that truth of, one, the word of God. Two, Jesus, our great high priest. And guess what? He's eternally securing you. If you deal with him and go toward him, he has secure a place for us. What a great high priest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this chapter. Perhaps just a, a summary, but perhaps even more, a reminder. A reminder that our great high priest so needed today. Oh, Lord, I thank you for every blessing and goodness and ask you, Lord, to be with us today as we uh, continue in our walk with you. We praise you this morning. We praise you for uh, the work that you've done in us. And I ask you, Lord, that any heart that needs commitment, security, any heart that needs strength, any heart that needs mercy and grace, they'll be able to find it just in time, just in time today. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus, our great high priest, our mediator. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's stand very quickly here. I'm going to have Anthony close us out, uh, uh, not in a song, uh, but in a prayer. Uh, he didn't want me to tell him to sing. He didn't want me to tell him to sing, but come on up, Anthony. And, uh, and he'll just bless us and pray for us after this message. And uh, uh, God bless you guys. Uh, Christian had to leave uh, very quickly for Mother's Day. So instead of a song today, I just decided it would be better if we pray. And we have Anthony close us out. God bless you guys. Okay. Sixteen. All right, let's come to our, our great high priest and our, our King Jesus. Um, 
he gives us that grace and that mercy. And the key for me there in that passage is, is, is for um, that mercy and that grace is for help in time of need. So he's there, he's, he's willing, and are we willing to call on him for help? Are we willing to admit that we need help? And that's the hard part sometimes, is not asking for help, but he's right there and he's, and he's, just, he's just waiting for us for that, that cry for help. So let's, let's ask him for help right now and you speak to him and, and by our words, by our heart, just pour it out before our Lord. Um, I just want, did want to say one thing that one day, um, like Abraham, we will see him and we will see him as he is. And, and as it says in Revelation, one day, Jesus, when he comes back, he'll wipe away every tear. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more mourning. No more crying. No more pain. It's interesting to me that it says, wipe away tears, mourning, and crying three times there. I think that there's a lot of, of crying and a lot of tears, whether we have them visibly or whether they're in our heart. We have a lot of tears that we pour out before God. And one day, he's going to wipe all those away. So it's good to know that when we're coming before him. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Our God, our King, our High Priest, who became man, who suffered, died, and was buried, and rose again, who died for our sins, Lord God, who went to the garden, Lord, and sweated blood, for us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, that he is worthy, that he was a worthy sacrifice. Thank you for sacrificing your son for us, for each and every one of us, Lord. Lord, we need your help today, Lord God. We need your help today. We need your help tomorrow. We know you're eternal and you'll be forever a high priest, as Pastor Marco said. So we know we can come to you forever, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to run towards you, Lord God. Help us to never turn back. Help us to never go back under the law or to religion or to our sin especially, Lord God. Help us to press forward. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to look forward to that hope, Lord God, that is your coming. Help my brothers and sisters here, Lord God, whether it's their marriages whether it's with their children, whether it's with their friends, family, neighbors, coworkers. Help us, God. We need your help. Would you help us, Lord God? We know you're willing, Lord God. So help us, Lord. Lord, we want to bless you today, Lord God, with our prayers. So Heavenly Father, would you answer our prayers according to your perfect will and your perfect love? We love you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.